Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to tonight's Henry Moore Institute research event. I'm Claire Nadell, Programme Coordinator at the Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you for a very special lecture with Professor David J. Getsy, which forms the first event in our series accompanying our new exhibition, The Colour of Anxiety, Race, Sexuality and Disorder in Victorian Sculpture, co-curated by Dr Nicola Jennings and Dr Adrian Childs, who I'm delighted can also join us tonight. We're very privileged to have Professor Getsey with us tonight, whose scholarship, particularly in his book, Body Doubles, Sculpture in Britain, 1877 to 1905, has been key to the thinking around the exhibition. The Colour of Anxiety is now on display at the Institute until the 26th of February. So if you've not had a chance to visit yet, then I do encourage you to do so. Um, the, ex the exhibition includes a sculpture called Pandora by Han Harry Bates, which will be featured in David's talk tonight. Um, and now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our co-curators, Dr Nicola Jennings and Dr Adrian Childs. Dr Nicola Jennings is, a, is director of the Athena Art Foundation and a visiting lecturer at the Courtauld Institute of Art in London. Nicola's teaching, research and publications have focused on art in Spain in the 15th, 16th and early 17th centuries, with a special interest in polychrome sculpture in wood, stone and terracotta. Um, Dr. Adrienne Childs is an independent art historian and curator. Um, she is a junk curator at the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC, and was the 2022 recipient of the Driscoll Prize in African American Award, uh, African American Art, awarded by the High Museum in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Her scholarly interests focus on the relationship between race and representation in European and American fine art and the decorative arts. And The Colour of Anxiety is a real testimony to Adrian and Nicola's combined areas of research and expertise. And so it's, we're really pleased for them to be here tonight. Um, and now I'm very happy to um, hand over to them both who, and they will introduce tonight's speaker. Hello. Well, thank you very much to Claire and all the team at the Henry Moore Institute because they worked very, very hard to put the exhibition on. Um, and uh, Adrienne and I are delighted um, to, uh, you know, to, to have been working with them. Adrienne's also here tonight, Adrienne Childs, my co-curator. And um, we are delighted ourselves to welcome David Getsey, um, who's, as Claire said, is, is one of the foremost scholars in uh, this field, the field of late Victorian sculpture, and who's written about several of the pieces and the sculptors whose work is in the exhibition. David is also a curator and the Eleanor Shea Professor of Art History at the University of Virginia. He's published widely on American and European art from the 19th century to the present, and his current projects address queer methodologies, links between transgender studies and art history, and archive-based recoveries of suppressed or lost histories of queer and genderqueer performance. He's written many books and articles on sculpture, including, as Claire said, the wonderful Body Double, Sculpture in Britain, 1877 to 1905. And that's really about the ways in that the new sculpture, as it was called at this time, sought to bring representations and materiality together to energize and anim animate statuary as a surrogate living presence. I'm not gonna say anything more. I know David's going to talk about one of the, the most extraordinary sculptures in the exhibition of Pandora. So I think, and Adrienne is going to um, start off the questions. So she, you'll be hearing from her after the talk, but let me hand over to David now. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank the Henry Moore Foundation, the Henry Moore Institute, um, uh, Adrian Childs, Nicola Jennings, Claire Nadal, and Kirsty Gregory for inviting me and all of the support along the way. Um, the, what I'm going to present today is um, one of uh, is an investigation into a, the theory of sculpture, which is one of the things that I indeed I uh, learned through working on uh, the new sculpture at the end of the 19th century. Um, so let me share the screen. So the current on exhibition on the cultural determinations of sculptural polychromy in 19th century Britain provides a new interpretation of the rapid transformations in figurative sculpture that occurred uh, at that time. And in particular, it was in the 1880s and 1890s, uh, which have long been understood as a time of stylistic heterogeneity within the figurative traditions of sculpture, as well as the formative years of modern sculpture in Britain. 
the exhibition organizers um, asked me to return to one of my analyses of this period. And this invitation has uh, prompted me to think about some of the theoretical implications of this transitional moment. So some years ago, I published an article on Harry Bates's Pandora from 1890, in which I argued that um, this sculpture articulated some of the themes of modern art, despite its seemingly conservative continuation of neoclassicism. This article uh, will be included with the publication that's accompanying the exhibition, um, but I wanna revisit that argument today in hopes that I might draw some further implications from it. Uh, this can, I hope, give us a workable and mobile term for sculpture theory that I'm going to call actuality, and I, I'll define it. Uh, and in turn, I'll argue that this term can be deployed as a standard against which to judge the fantasized bodies of late 19th century sculpture, uh, some in the exhibition. Now, actuality, as I'm defining it, is the one-to-one -one scale representation of a functional object that functions as that object. We can understand this, as I'm gonna argue, um, as an extreme form of representational realism in which the ontological distance between sculptural image and sculptural object is narrowed or indeed even erased. This um, representational proximity, uh, and this is a term I'm gonna to use to talk about the degree of actuality, um, this representational proximity is related to what is sometimes called literalism or objecthood by the time we hit the 1960s. Um, and um, literalism or objecthood is uh, the case in which a sculpture or occasionally a painting repudiates all representation and illusion, becoming simply and provocatively, provocatively a new invention in the world. And this idea of literalism um, was the core of the art theory that developed around minimal art and it's often summed up by Dan Flavin's aphorism um, through which he defined his own literal sculptures made from fluorescent tubes, where he says, it is what it is and it ain't nothing else, unquote. Actuality, I'm going to argue, holds this literalism, this is what it is quality, in a dynamic tension with realism and representation. And it is achieved, uh, actuality is achieved when that rock, uh, representational proximity between image and object is at its thinnest limits. And this will make a lot more sense when we start looking at, um, at works of art themselves. Now, I first began to think about actuality with a work in this exhibition, and this is the Pandora by Harry Bates from 1890. This was a very important work for him. Uh, Bates had previously focused primarily on shallower compositions and relief sculpture. And this, but this life-size sculpture was more fully in the round. And it was also the first time he experimented with multiple materials. Bates had a commitment to the decorative. And with this work, he sought to fuse some of its potential uh, with the genre of the freestanding nude sculpture. And it was the genre of the freestanding nude through which late Victorian artists staked out their theoretical claims. Now, in creating a life-size statue like Pandora as a statement of his commitments and beliefs, Bates was in step with his contemporaries, most of whom used the Royal Academy summer exhibitions as the arena in which to make art theoretical statements through ambitious and polemical statues. Uh, in my book on uh, Victorian sculpture that was mentioned earlier, I tracked five artists who adapted the life-size nudes uh, terms and possibilities in order to engage with the works themselves um, into debates about sculpture's future. And it was the ideal statue, I argued, that underwrote the explosion of the production and innovation of sculpture in Britain in the last quarter of the 19th century. Susan Beatty had previously argued that it was architectural and decorative sculpture that was the framework for the movement known as the new sculpture. Um, our two accounts, however, uh, I believe are not in incommensurable. Indeed, for such a complex artistic transformation, there's got to be more than one motor to explain it. Um, and the Pandora, uh, I think, is particularly important because it can be understood as a key nexus of these vectors of sculptural change between the life-size statue as an art theoretical genre and the importance of architectural and decorative sculpture at the time. And in many ways, we can understand uh, 
Bates's complex, and I'm going to argue uh, uh, philosophical work, um, was attempting to provide a synergy and a differentiation between the nude and the decorative by thinking about levels of representational proximity. Now, Bates produced a work that compelled viewers to contrast body and object in the sculpture itself. The figure he sculpted from undifferentiated white marble, producing a monochrome nude that both cited and updated Victorian sculptures not entirely accurate understanding of the ideal form of classicism inherited from antiquity. Other than um, her headwear, no clothing or jewelry interrupt, interrupt the smooth rendering of the flesh. The amplified monochromy of this sculptural body, however, was set against Pandora's sole attribute, the elaborate ivory and gilt bronze box at which she gazes. The ivory of the box seems almost warm next to the stark whiteness of the statue. In contrast to the smooth surface of Pandora's body, this chryselephantine object is packed with detail and is immediately recognizable as being made of different materials than Bates's use of conventional white marble for the statue itself. For this work, Bates chose to depict a scene that hinged on the relationship to a functional object. In Greek mythology, Pandora was the first woman uh, and uh, she was created out of clay by Zeus as a punishment to mankind. The Pandora myth is expressive of and rooted in sexism, and its story of the birth of human sexual difference centered on the dangers brought to earth by the invention of the category of woman. As this problematic story goes, Pandora was entrapped by the gods who stored all manner of evil and discord in a jar, uh, and later this became understood and transmuted into a box, as it is in Pandora's, um, in Bates's sculpture. In the myth, Pandora, out of curiosity, opens this container, thus releasing these evils and ills into the world. The Pandora myth and the common phrase Pandora's box have come to stand for the loss of innocence and safety, as well as the careless beginnings of trouble and chaos. Bates's statue presents Pandora before this fall, covetously gazing at the beautiful box in her hands. The relief cycle on the sides of the box illustrates the scenes of her creation up until this moment. As the, um, as the myth goes, Pandora was created out of clay by Hephaestus and brought to life by the four winds. On the facets of the casket, Bates charted Pandora's transformation from statue to living being. Like the first man, Prometheus made from clay, and like the oft-repeated story of Pygmalion's Galatea, the story of Pandora is a story of sculptural images that come to to life. Bates depicted her in various stages of her transformation from statue to woman on the facets of the casket, and here she is being adorned by the goddesses before being sent to tempt um, Epimetheus. Uh, here's another um, uh, work of the, um, of the box outside of the statue. Uh, this is the same object. It was just removed for conservation purposes. Um, the lid um, of the box shows the last of these moments uh, presenting a sleeping Pandora being taken from Olympus by Hermes, and images of her escort anchor the four corners of the, the box in bronze and gilt. The box thus has a dual purpose. It both narrates Pandora's origins as a statue, and it also functions itself as the object of the ever-present moment of temptation on which this story anchors. And we're going to, we are midway through the Pandora myth with Bates's statue. Now, the mythological character Pandora was not an uncommon subject for sculptures, but was rarely, but rarely was this story of her creation, as opposed to her fault, foregrounded so explicitly as it was by Bates in the casket. The long frontal side of the casket, again, depicts Pandora in her early stages as an, as an inert statue. And um, here Pandora's hand covers an image of two additional goddesses that are on this facet, but the box is fully completed as we saw. 
Now, this bas-relief image of Pandora as a sculpture is immediately recognizable as being uh, uh, heavily morphologically similar to Bates's life-size statue, um, with the composition being repeated in miniature on the ivory box. The small Pandora on the box is in the same crouching contrapposto as the life-size statue that holds the box. And the only major difference is that, um, is that the box is not in her hands in the bas-relief. Upon recognizing this repeated image of the crouching Pandora on the casket, it's thus suggested to viewers that they are looking at a statue that lacks the divine breath that made the mythological Pandora flesh and blood. Through the parallel with the depicted creation myth on the casket, Bates equates the life-size statue with a mere marble representation of, the bo of a body, that is, as a self-evident simulation. The statue's whiteness is asserted to be that of stone, in contrast to the organic hue of the, of the ivory. However, this inert statue does hold what one cannot help but recognize as an actual decorative object. And we can think of this as, um, you know, in movies or a Photoshop trick, when there is a black and white photo and one element is put in color, it uh, is a way of emphasizing its reality. And there's a similar tactic and play with monochromy and polychromy that's happening as part of the internal dynamics of this work. Even though the box remains somewhat inaccessible due to its integration into the sculpture as a whole, nevertheless, it's clearly distinct from the figure of Pandora. The box is a box, and any viewer attentive enough to the details would be able to perceive that the lid was separate and thus able to be removed. This dynamic relationship between statue and object is what characterizes this sculpture. Bates organized the work as a series of internal distinctions between the casket and the figure who holds it. The intricate detail of the former versus the smooth and largely undifferentiated handling of the figure poly, um, on the other. Um, the polychromy versus monochromy um, and the warmth of the organic material of the ivory versus the inorganic coldness of white stone. Now, throughout, I should note that I'm going to talk about these staged internal different differentiations um, within uh, this work and indeed other works as the work's syntax. Polychromy and actuality um, are both syntactical relations um, that a sculpture organizes within itself to determine the sculptural ensemble and its message. Now, Bates's choice to stage the syntactical distinction between the simulated body and the real box of course, did not go unnoticed by contemporary viewers who often found it quite uncomfortable. A reviewer for the Magazine of Art in 1890 remarked upon the, quote, introduction of warmth and color, which at once suggests the necessity for a complete polychromatic system of surface decoration, end quote. The same reviewer went on to suggest that at least Pandora's hair and face should be tinted to make the work consistent. Other commentators agreed, as when the prominent uh, Victorian critic, Marion Spielman, noted, quote, it would doubtless have been better had the ivory embellishment been in marble too, unquote. Regarding the relatively undifferentiated and almost conservatively neoclassical treatment of Pandora's monochrome body, Edmund Goss, arguably the major sculpture critic of the 1880s and 1890s, dismissively wrote that the sculpture, quote, is exquisite in feeling and composition, but as Mr. Bates's work is apt to be, unfinished in the last degree, and indeed scarcely carried far enough for exhibition, unquote. Critics such as Spielman and Goss approached the Pandora as they would any other statue, expecting its focus to be on the sculptural body, um, and expecting the representational, the level of representational proximity, as I'm going to call it, to be consistent across the work of art. But it was the body, however, that Bates chose to make more distant and to suppress in favor of the vivid decorative object. Now, one might ask what this box really does contain, but we would never bring that same level of empirical curiosity to the marble figure and its insides. In effect, Bates staged an ontological distinction between the sculptural representation of the figure and the potentially functional literal box. In other words, these, this internal syntactical relation between the components of the sculpture establishes a hierarchy of sculptural actuality. 
Bert Bates sculpted the box in these particular materials to make it both self-evidently both precious and literally present. In this way, he underscored the Pandora myth by making the conceptual focus of the statue the elaborate decorative object that, like Galatea or Pandora herself, actually does cross the threshold between sculptural image and the quotidian world of living bodies and objects of use. In short, the Pandora myth is reinforced by making an actual box that could be opened and by staging it as a haptic object for both the statue and for us, the viewers. The idealized nude recedes in comparison. Bates's ivory and bronze casket is simultaneously a sculpture and a functional box. It is covered itself with representations, but the reliefs and figures decorating it um, at base do not uh, mitigate its potential to be used as a box. Um, and again, just to be painfully obvious about this, by contrast, the figural image of Pandora can never be equivalent to uh, a person. The box, in other words, becomes an object of attention and desire for Pandora and a present temptation for the viewers themselves. One can more readily imagine opening this casket than they could imagine touching Pandora's hair, for instance. They may touch the sculpture of um, the sculpted representation of Pandora's hair if they touch the white marble object, but they won't be touching hair. But if that same viewer touches the ivory um, and bronze box, they are touching an actual ivory and bon bronze box. Um, and in this sense, that the idea of the box as the object of temptation for Pandora also becomes the object of temptation for us. Any touching of the sculpture, of course, would violate it. Um, and Bates uses that temptation as part of the reinforcement of the moralizing tale of Pandora's fall from innocence. Um, now, what I find so interesting and important about Bates's sculpture is the way that it stages this um, ontological distinction between sculptural representation as a depiction and sculptural representation as an equivalency. The box that object to be coveted and dreaded in the Pandora myth, that box exhibits actuality through its particular syntax, the internal relationship of its parts and the levels of representational proximity to, act, to the actual. And this makes it all the more real and one could say all the more threatening, uh, the box that is. Bates's sculpture emphasizes this high degree of uh, representational proximity in sculpting an actual box. And he set this in contrast to the monochrome whiteness of the statue with an extremely low degree of representational proximity. And again, think about touching Pandora's hair or headgear, um, where we would only ever be touching a representation. Uh, we would never be touching the thing, but the box is both of those. With its self-reflective account of the terms of sculptural images, Bates's Pandora must be understood as a modern sculpture. And that is, it is one that tests the limits of medium as a means to prompt a reconsideration of the received understandings of how that medium has been used. And of course, I'm gonna to pause to acknowledge that this idea of medium and its specificity is but one of the many characterizations of modern art, but nevertheless it is, despite its incompleteness and often uh, being over-argued, is nevertheless one of many useful ways to account for, the, for a robust tradition of self-reflection um, in modern art, unquote. Uh, and um, modern art is often seen through stylistic categories uh, when we're talking about this, but Bates' Pandora reminds us that similar aims of self-reflectivity can be established from within the styles that were then and now deemed as traditional or conservative. Um, and this is what I, I think is um, fantastic about late Victorian sculpture is that it's, it's, a, it's actually highly theoretical in relationship to the idea of what sculptural representation is. And many of the artists were in a high degree of sort of competitive jockeying with each other to make statements about tradition and innovation through the objects themselves. Um, here, Bates both invoked the conservatism of the neoclassical nude, but he did so not as an unthinking retention of authority or style, but as an opportunity to comment on that tradition and its future, 
through the dynamic play with actuality in the form of the representation of the functional object that in turn has the capacity to function as that object. Well, I've been thinking about Bates's sculpture for a long time. And it was through thinking about it and its challenges to the figurative tradition that uh, allowed me to start asking about actuality and functionality in modern and modernist sculpture. And I began to see the question of representational proximity, of how close the image and the object come together as a useful way to characterize some of the transformations uh, in 20th century art. In particular, um, thinking about Bates informed my investigation into the post-minimalist sculptor, Scott Burton, on whom I just uh, published a book uh, last month. Uh, working in New York in the 1970s and 80s, Burton was an art critic, performance artist, and sculptor who processed the lessons of mineral, uh, minimalism and literalism, but rejected as uh, what he saw as its cold universal, um, a P, uh, universalism. Burton understood well the potential of literalism's it is what it is stance, but he sought to imbue that presence and literalism with a capacity for more direct bodily and personal um, contact and content. He did this through actuality and his sculptural career focused on depictions of chairs and benches that functioned as chairs and benches. Now, in my new book, I chart how his works both depict and perform as chairs, and I show how this critical dissemblance and productive duplicity were developed out of Burton's exploration of the queer navigation of the power dynamics of public space, and in particular of the um, pleasures and dangers and theoretical uh, concerns that are associated with street cruising um, and the idea of communicating um, uh, under the unwitting eye of, um, of the rules of normative space. Now, in short, Burton made works that could hide in plain sight and wait to be used. I'm not going to retrace the whole argument here, but I'm happy to um, talk about Scott Burton in the question and answer period. But um, instead, I'm going to provide a short discussion of another work, uh, another first major sculpture that, like Bates's Pandora, uses actuality as it means to comment on the potential of sculpture itself. Burton's bronze chair from 1975 comments on the figurative tradition through its use of bronze and introduces actuality into it. Um, in um, 1969, Burton moved into a tenement apartment in Little Italy in New York to find an abandoned chair in a derivative Queen Anne style. He lived with and thought about this chair for a few years, and in 1972, he decided he would make it a sculpture. At first, the destitute artist could only paint the work in bronze color, but in 1975, he received a grant to cast the work in metal, and he declared it his first sculpture. But choosing to cast this chair in the high art material of bronze, Burton aimed to elevate the disregarded object in its neglected style. He chose bronze for this reason, to connect his sculpture to the traditions of figurative statuary and to the monument. In this regard, the bronze chair is like the Pandora. It, they both play with style and material in order to comment on and build upon the figurative tradition. But long outmoded in the 1960s and 70s in the wake of minimal and conceptual art, the material of bronze was a conventional material of sculptural representation and memorialization. Burton, however, capitalized on this, these set of connotations and on um, Casting's ability to capture verisimilitude in order to replicate this functional object in a one-to-one -one scale. And so this is a work that is clearly a bronze representational uh, work of art. It's, with a, it's a realist sculpture of a chair that in turn can be used as a chair. And we should remember that even though um, bronze chair does not depict picked a human form, it operates as a statue. It's a life-size bronze with arms and legs and so on. This anthropomorphism allows bronze chair to evoke the human body without imaging it. Furthermore, it addressed viewers directly by offering them an empty seat, both as an actual physical incitement to sit and as an emotionally charged image of the absence of or anticipation of a sitter. 
this usable vacant chair lent itself, in other words, to viewers' bodily engagements and projections. In the context of Burton's post-minimalism, these effects of the bronze chair's fusion of sculptural image and functional object are best understood as properly theatrical. In Michael Fried's infamous attack on minimalism and theatricality, he had warned that is, quote, almost as though the work in question had been waiting for him, unquote. For the artists who Fried critiqued as literalist, this theatrical address was produced through the banishment of all representation and illusion. Burton's bronze chair produces that same theatricality, however, that is um, analogous to the literalist object, but importantly, it does through, so through its realism, through its high degree of one-to-one -one scale, uh, verisimilar representation. That is, Burton's bronze chair achieves an amplified bodily relation in space with the viewer through its deadpan use of bronze casting to represent a chair at a one-to-one -one scale and casting as a mode of sculptural representation and life-size reproduction is the key to the transformation of the original Queen Anne chair into a bronze sculpture that in turn performs as a chair. The literalism of bronze chair is in the sense performative. The sculptural image is rather than merely depicts a chair in its function. No less than minimalism's gray polyhedrons, lines of bricks, fluorescent tubes, or stacks of aluminum and plexiglass, Burton's functional chair is what it is. But Burton's um, sculpture is also a bronze representation of a chair. The actual functionality of bronze chair short circuits the conventional opposition of literalism and representation. Um, and I think this is a really important, and uh, I hope you can see now that this, these kind of questions of how um, representation and, um, and actuality are operating in this dynamic tension in both the Bates and the Burton. Now, this collapse of the polarity of representation and literalism through the one-to-one -one mimesis of a functional object, that is actuality, is a philosophically rich question, and Burton cannily built upon it. He was not the only one concerned with the problem of the sculpture of a chair, however. A few years before this work, the French, uh, French philosopher Etienne Guilson had remarked that, quote, the statue of a marble chair is a marble chair, but the statue of a seated man is not a seated man, unquote. Um, such a statement responds to and registers an earlier discussion um, by Ernst Gombrich uh, who in the 1960 Art and Illusion laid out a dilemma. I'm actually going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to um, go fully into this. But um, importantly, one of the things that Gombrich is interested in is thinking about when the actual object becomes a sign for the category of couch or chair. Um, and ultimately, um, Burton or Gombrich's concern concern is the inverse of Burton's, and he's asking how the couch becomes a sign. Um, for him, a cardboard image and an actual couch serve their purpose by signifying couchness, right? Um, but only one would function in the living room. Burton's work, however, is less concerned with how the actuality of a chair can become a sign uh, but rather, it was with how the one-to-one -one scale representation of a functional object becomes equivalent to that object. Um, and, and in this way, he sort of answers or responds to himself Gombrich's question. Uh, Burton would go on to make this the basis for his sculptural practice in which functional objects um, are represented in sculptures that perform as those functional objects. And so there's always a, um, a uh, distinction in that Burton's works are always representational and literal. And um, if we were to really like spin out into many different forms of modernist art theory, you could think of this distinction between representation and functionality in Burton's works as an example of what Marcel Duchamp called the infrothin, one of many examples. Right? Um, 
But um, Burton's sculptural practice, I'm just going to show a few things here, um, trades on this idea of the representation that functions as the object. And he increasingly became ambitious in relationship to moving this into public spaces in which that functionality allowed his works to hide in plain sight as art and to solicit interactions. And here I'm just showing a few more. Um, if ever anyone goes to CAA in New York, uh, this is uh, right around the corner. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, and um, I'll come back to talk about this in a second, uh, this particular work. Other um, scholars have been concerned with this. This philosophical problem is central to the problem of sculpture and its differentiation between objects. For instance, in 1976, the year of the, um, the bronze chair, Rosalind Krauss would ask, quote, what would a sculpture look like if it were not illusionistic and thereby, and thereby did not propose a transcendence of reality? Well, it might look like a ready-made, that is an ordinary object like a hat rack or a chair, which was literally indistinguishable from the world of everyday use, unquote. Uh, here, Krauss acknowledged the same exception to the opposition of representation to literalism that Burton had also arrived at through his work, the, the mimetic function, uh, the mimetic representation of a functional object effectively becomes that object. Burton's bronze, bronze chair plays up its status as just such a part of the world of everyday use, but simultaneously as apart from it through its high stakes um, use of bronze. However, Burton's other furniture sculptures do become, quote, literally indistinguishable from the world of everyday use in their camouflaging as mere furniture and their infiltration of public spaces. And I should say that even the bronze chair as a, as a bronze statue gets mistaken all the time for a piece of serviceable furniture and, and for the public. At the Art Institute of Chicago, where the bronze chair lives, museum guards have told me that it is a regular occurrence to see someone attempt to have a seat um, in the sculpture without knowing that it is also a sculpture. But it's important that according to Burton um, and his attitude towards a dem uh, democratic art, that these people who just sit in the chair are unselfconsciously are absolutely not wrong. As Burton intended, the bronze chair is something everyone can understand, and it waits for beholders to become sitters by putting themselves into its embrace. The bronze chair is manifold. It performs as a realist statue, a vernacular exemplar, a functional piece of furniture, a ready-made, and a literalist thing with theatrical objecthood. Um, and in this, um, the, all of these manifold performances hinge on, like in, as in Bates's Pandora, the introduction of actuality. Now, I will just briefly show how Burton was really committed to this idea of the, um, the representation that becomes the thing. Um, when he first showed his, this work at Artist Space in 1975 in his first one-person exhibition, um, this work was displayed outside um, uh, across the street from Artist Space. Um, now, street signals, cruising, and dissemblance had been central themes of Burton's artistic practice in these years, and now he further declared the importance of the shared space of the street and of hiding in plain sight within it with this work. Because on the street, Burton's sculpture dissembled his chair. To many, this metal chair appeared at first as an abandoned piece of domestic furniture hanging out on the street, waiting to be taken to somebody's home. Again, for Burton, this chair's performance drew on his long-running line of investigation of street cruising and other tactics of survival and conviviality that made up queer experiences of the urban street. Burton was interested in the duplicity of appearing as normal, and he built on the easy familiarity and solicitations of this homey-looking furniture piece. A lone Queen Anne chair on a sidewalk is not that remarkable in New York City, where trash is piled on the sidewalks because there's no alleys. And Burton staged this chair so it would act as an abandoned chair for the passerby, while also being a sculpture for those who took the time to look or who were already on the lookout for it. Now, this sculptural performance, um, you know, again, happened um, at uh, an exhibition and Burton and his friends would set up um, chair watching parties where they kept an eye on the chair from the facing window to see what the interactions were. Um, this ultimately proved wise because 
um, bronze chair's street performance revealed a great deal to him. Most people did walk by it as if it was urban waste. Um, and um, the um, art critic and curator Edith de Ack wrote that, quote, this work, uh, bronze chair is design designed to be indistinguishable from any chair left outside. Hence, it is both utilitarian and garbage, according to New York slum habits, unquote. Um, thanks to the effectiveness of the sculpture's urban camouflage, however, more than a few people were enticed to carry away this apparently abandoned treasure on those Saturday afternoons. The few passersby who did attempt to pick up a bronze chair were befuddled by its approximately 250 pounds of solid metal. Um, the duplicity of this chair became um, evident as soon as one attempted to move it. Um, this, I'm um, thinking that this object was merely such a piece of utilitarian garbage and then realizing perhaps to some embarrassment that it was not a normal chair because of its material and weight, people on the street found themselves faced with a number of dilemmas. They were forced to reconsider their expectations of public space. They faced the frustration of their desire to possess this object. Again, a key theme. They were compelled to ask just what type of thing they had encountered on the sidewalk, and they likely resented being duped by it, but they also questioned what the function of this object might be. While Burton wanted the work to be used, he didn't want it to uh, disappear entirely. Um, and for some of these would-be street scavengers, the obdurate resistance of the weighty chair became a challenge. Um, and as Burton recalled, it, quote, it became like a happening thing, uh, unquote, um, because the chair was too heavy for one person to carry off alone, uh, two or more people would attempt to um, steal it um, uh, along with their friends. Burton quickly realized that this work's duplicity <clears throat> could be read almost as a dare to some viewers. Um, and his aim to create, his aim was to create work that operated equally well in public space with both art and non-art audiences, but bronze chair, however, came into focus for Burton as doing something that, um, that was not in accord with his democratizing agenda, because it was fooling people. Um, this taught him something, though, that he needed to go further into, uh, into uh, a, a thinner representational proximity between image and object. Burton would soon abandon bronze cast of furniture and um, instead moved to later works in granite that were equally unmovably heavy, but they did they appeared as unmoving and heavy uh, in order to avoid the bronze chair's impersonation of a wooden chair. Um, and indeed, uh, Burton came to realize that his public works must comfortably be both street furniture and art without such a division, however minuscule, between the represented chair and the functional sculptural object. <coughs> So in other words, Burton leaned into actuality with his subsequent um, chair and bench sculptures. The signal of the traditional sculptural material of bronze, as well as the appropriation of the found object through one-to-one -one imaging processes, such as casting, were set aside in favor of an even higher, or even maybe say thinner, uh, degree of representational proximity between a sculpture of a chair and a chair itself. In his terms, the sculptures began to perform more convincingly as furniture, and they did this through actuality. Now, one of the things I like about this comparison of Pandora and the bronze chair is that they both confound expectations uh, about style. If we only attended to the shared stylistic and formal developments in modern sculpture, both of these works would be disqualified. Bates's work appears to look backward to a more generalized version of neoclassical marble figures, and he intentionally um, did this in order to make a larger case about that tradition and its innovation, as I've um, argued elsewhere. Burton's realist bronze sculpture seems entirely out of place in the New York art world of the 1960s and 70s, when minimalism and post-minimalism dominated the conversation. And it seems only at first, though, uh, I would argue, unrelated to debates around abstraction, objecthood, and theatricality. But I hope my whirlwind tour through this object has convinced you that it actually is engaged with objecthood and theatricality. So with both these works, 
When we ask about the coordination of image and object, of depiction and function, these sculptures come into focus for the ways in which they smartly comment on and instruct about fundamental problems for the horizons of three-dimensional representation. Both works make the case that the one-to-one -one scale uh, sculptures of functional objects transgress the boundaries of representation. And in so doing, they raise the question of actual and direct contact. Um, many people have and will continue to touch statues of all, of all kinds. And uh, there are, as I've argued um, elsewhere, ethical implications to our relations with figurative sculpture. But sculptural actuality offers more than just an image in three dimensions that may be touched. Actuality is a bridge between sculptural representation and the world of everyday use and engagement. Sculptures such as Pandora and bronze chairs both perform that possibility while also being sculptural images. <clears throat> but what is important is that they stage desire for the object, desire to uh, touch, to hold, to take away the object. Bates through the Pandora myth and it's focusing on the casket as the object of temptation and Burton by positioning his work in relationship to um, this culture of street furniture that might be taken away. And so by exceeding the boundaries of sculptural representation to achieve actuality, they activate the desirous and haptic um, uh, relationship of the viewer to the sculpture in, I think, a, a psychologically charged and quite interesting way. Um, on either sides of modern sculpture, they both these works capitalize on the staging of the border crossings between art and life, image and object. Actuality, in other words, is not just crucial to these works, it also prompts us to ask about its role in other histories of sculpture. And indeed, one of the things I would like to propose to you is that this question of representational proximity and actuality is a useful way of thinking um, about many different forms of sculptural representation. Um, and um, it can even be posed to works that, unlike these two, do not prompt us to achieve uh, that kind of actuality. So what I'm tentatively proposing is that the limit case of actuality allows us to consider how all sculptures can be viewed through their varied levels of representational proximity or distance. In short, how closely does the sculptural image approach um, functioning as the thing it represents? Now, a premise of the exhibition for which this talk is a, um, an adjunct, um, the, a premise is that polychromy uh, must be understood in a complex way as mediating shifts in cultural attitudes towards bodies and their colors. Polychromy uh, is a means to gauge how much a sculpture approximates the chromatic complexity of the world that surrounds us, but representational proximity is also a means to gauge how much a sculpture approximates the use of objects in that world. In other words, actuality or its refusal might, uh, might work with synergistically an investigation of sculptural monochromy and polychromy for an understanding of how these syntactical relations relate and indeed sometimes reinforce each other. So for instance, if we look at Bates's, Bates's Pandora, we can more directly see how the syntax of the sculpture establishes a differentiation along both of these axes of polychromy and actuality. The figure is, in this sense, doubly white because of its syntax. That is, it's uh, the monochromy versus polychromy, the marble versus ivory and bronze, and the statue versus functional object. In all of these ways, when we think about it as the appearance of, uh, uh, of, its, uh, of its color and of the levels of representational proximity, one could argue that the morality tale that Bates tells through the chryselephantine object containing the loss of innocence is based not just on Pandora, um, the sculpture of Pandora being white, but by her pre-fall state being categorically different than the world of everyday use and everyday things. In other words, the world that surrounds us. Her whiteness is not just surface appearance, 
is not just racialized, but it's also ontologically positioned in opposition to the everyday quotidian touchable world. In this sense, the ideality of this work and of its whiteness is made even more distant and out of touch um, and in, in this sense reinforced as a universal. Now, in a, in a similar way, but I, um, we might ask the questions of actuality towards different objects in the exhibition. So, uh, for instance, George Frampton's Lamia or Charles Cordier's African Venus, they both flirt with the condition of actuality through their representations of jewelry. In addition to the colors of both of these statuary busts, these works prompt such haptic relations um, that actuality incites by offering, offering jewelry and adornment as being both in our world and in the world of the sculpture. Um, but because of this border crossing, it's available to touch and indeed to fantasies of use. Um, now, um, I don't have the time to do so here, but we could unpack the ways that such an implication of actuality in parts of the sculpture might serve to imply erotic possibility through the haptic um, levels of representational proximity and its crossing of the space between image and touchable object. Now, this is one reason why I think that it's um, that this question of representational proximity or distance should be coordinated with our assessment of the cultural implications of polychromy and color. Um, so in other words, if we think complexly about a sculpture, we should think about it um, as a complex material object, as a complex chromatic object that is um, achieving the resemblance to things in the world, but also in this level of its representational distance where the, um, where the depiction becomes a thing uh, in and of itself um, in our world. In sum, we must ask of sculpture to what degree representation and materiality, that is image and object coordinate. This general question has indeed driven all of my work um, and I see it as underwriting an investigation into seemingly um, stylistically divergent moments in modern sculpture and divergent works. And so um, I have tracked some of these questions of materiality and representation, image and object and their coordination from the corporeality aspired to by the British new sculptors to August Rodin's development of modern sculpture through a stage agonism between image and object, um, through to 1960s abstraction and its pursuit of literalism and bodily terms, and then and more recently to Scott Burton's democratic usable furniture created out of works that queerly dissemble and hide in plain sight. Asking such questions of sculpture disarranges the canonical and traditional stories of its evolution, and it allows for unlikely comparisons, like the one I offer between Bates and Burton today, and actuality as a limit case of sculpture's interplay of representation and materiality, I hope this, co this comparison helps reinforce, rides on the bodily solicitations of the functional object and its activation of a direct and haptic um, engagement. And sculptors such as Bates and Burton, in their very different ways, deployed actuality as an art theoretical limit in order to amplify sculpture's possibilities for engagement with and indeed implication of us as viewers in the, in the shared space of sculptural representation and of sculptural objecthood. Well, thank you very much. I believe I uh, went over a little on time, but I'm sorry for that, but uh, I'm happy to take any questions you might have now. Uh, Thank you very much, David. Wow, what a wonderful um, presentation. Lots of food for thought. Um, should we, um, do you want to keep your PowerPoint up or do you want to just go to, uh, I'm, we have faces. I am trying to get it back. I hid the meeting controls and, I, <laughs> and I'm trying to like get them back. <laughs> there okay. it is. Okay. All right. well, again, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, I will start out quickly with a, a question, uh, totally self-serving, of course, 
because um, I'm interested in decorative arts and I'm interested in the way you're talking about the functionality and, and sort of the, the, these interesting relationships between the functionality and the sculpturalness, et cetera. But I work on objects like Pandora in ways that juxtapose the actual functional object and it's intended to be, right? Like a candelabra or a chandelier or a bowl that is also um, juxtaposed with a sculptural body like a black a a black figure holding a candelabra, holding a bowl. But the uh, at the outset, the intent is for the object to be functional, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they, uh, they're they often in, in, depicted in the act of actually serving. So it's enhancing or being, um, you know, and what it's it's serving the, whatever function it is supposed to do, like holding the candelabra. It, it can even be a bronze, right, made out of this kind of venerable material. But what? How do these ideas um, work it, when you're talking about an object like that that is not intended to be high art, and and we don't just you know, as and it's intended to be decorative, and we we almost never give those objects the same kind of you know critical attention mm -hmm. that we do to sculpture. Um, and particularly when it's overlaid with this I issue of slavery and how it represents, you know, the slave body in many ways in the functioning as a servant in ser servitude, but those things often get lost. But mm -hmm. so does, does this work that you're doing work in that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think for, first of all, the the differenti differentiation and division between the so-called decorative arts um, and sculpture is, um, you know, contextual but also arbitrary and somewhat artificial. And I think um, these same concepts about whether an object um, is uh, does an object purport to be a depiction of any kind? Is it an image? That automatically introduces a range of questions and philosophical questions about um, image versus object. And so this, this same set of questions would hold true for, um, uh, for a so-called decorative object, a uh, relief sculpture, um, or a statue here. One of the things we ask, as you just noted, we ask different questions, however, based on the context into which these objects are placed. So if we see one, um, you know, in um, in the context of an art gallery or the Royal Academy summer exhibitions, this prompts us to be thinking more on the realm of the uh, representational side of these things. And if we see the um, that same object in a, a trade fair, we might think more about the functional side of it. But again, these are um, different uh, weightings of the same set of questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that that these are these are applicable. This is why it, it's a it's a kind of philosophical question about three dimensional representation. Um, but it, and it's one that those who make sculptural depictions. Um, and position them in relationship to things like art exhibitions and galleries and museums um, tend to distill some of those questions in a different way. And I think that's what both Bates and Burton do and why they make good didactic objects for this general question that we could pursue broadly. Mm -hmm. More interesting as an answer to your question, however, is that um, you said yourself that some of these, um, these moments of the overlap or the coordination between an image and the and the object of use are about serving. Um, and, and so they produce both um, power dynamics between the user and the object and the depiction that's holding that object. Um, and as I would argue, you know, may, Bates and Burton make clear that questions of desire are also wrapped up in those questions of the, of the hierarchies of power. And so, um, and you know, the, image that holds a decorative object, say like a plate, you know, or a, uh, or a lamp or something like that, um, that, you know, automatically, that hierarchy of actuality is another way of thinking through how these works might be um, expressive of or responding to cultural power dynamics. Yeah. Um, I don't think, one of the things I want to emphasize, like I, I chose two works that kind of give us the same answer. But I think this question of representational um, proximity and its syntax will produce different answers um, depending on the content of the work and its exhibition and other things. Mm 
And so, um, so I do think there's a, it's a useful way of thinking through a lot of different things when we really understand the implications of what, uh, of what three dimensional representation, um, or, or thinking of that levels of three dimensional representation as part of a way in which a sculpture or an or a sculptor or a decorative um, artist produces a set of possibilities for meaning out of the work. Um, and again, you know, syntaxes are all based in unevenness and differentiation and power, and so that um, they are deployed in relationship to other elements to make a case. Thank you. Um... Nicola, do we have some questions? Uh, I can't see any more questions just yet, but um, I would love to, well, first of all, thank David for what, that extraordinary talk. I'm going to have to listen to it again on the recording <laughs> a few times, I think, to absorb everything that you're saying, because um, it was it was really, really, um, really rich. Um, and I loved, first of all, I loved the way that you um, showed us the sort of the modernity of Bates's conception and how you can look at a sculpture which is apparently quite um, re re retrospective looking or very traditional looking in its, um, in its form and actually use it to or, or, or that find that it, it sparks a whole series of ontological questions about the nature of sculpture, which, is, which are actually incredibly modern, um, if one thinks about that. I mean, I think sculptors have probably been doing that for a very long time. So one could think that some Renaissance sculptors were quite modern or even medieval sculptors were quite modern because um, they were probably doing that too. But, um, but, I, but I think I, I love the way that you, that you highlighted that, um, that, that, that contrast between its outward appearance and actually what it, it could lead you to think about. Um, but the, the thing that, that occurred to me, which is maybe a different way of thinking about what you're, what what you've been speaking about, is that in some ways, to me, it's a bit like Pandora. By making Pandora, the the the, the figure of Pandora, white and remote and very much a um, a sculpture, whereas the box is is organic, is almost living, is coloured. Is almost like the, um, the the Galatea that comes to life. Um, it, it almost felt to me like it made me think that maybe what what Bates was trying to do was to tell us that um, to, to bring to activate this this ancient myth of Pandora in a way to 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 bring this this box of evil into our contemporary space. She is a myth, and this by by means of this box we understand. That evil is still alive in our world. That it's still that it's still about to, you know, the box is about to be opened. It's about to explode into our world. So he sort of activates that whole myth in a way that's um, that I think is really interesting, and and it makes me relate it to his other sculpture that's in the exhibition, the Moors Janua Vitae, where he's clearly very concerned about issues. You know, he's Moors Janua. He 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 produces as he's dying, I think, or he he think, he knows he's about to die quite soon. And so it's a sort of valedictory piece and that the iconography of it is very much thinking about life and death and what happens afterwards. So he's he's clearly a real, he's a, he's a great thinker, um, Bates. And I, I think we, we don't know very much about him, but we can infer all these things from the kind of work that you've been doing, thinking about what his sculpture tells us. So, sorry, that's a bit of a rambling reflection, but mm -hmm. just wanted to make that point. Yeah, well, um, thank you. I will say that, so uh, this is, of course, based on this article I wrote um, now some um, 20 years ago, but in that article, it's, I focus these questions on the relationship of the decorative to the figurative tradition. Um, and what I've done today is sort of tried to think, uh, you know, with these 20 years of reflection and thinking about it, um, the this syntactical relation between actual object um, and image as being a dynamic of desire. And I think you're right that in this way, um, we can see that um, this work as aligning itself with this kind of uh, fascination with the femme fatale, with loss of innocence, with the dangers um, of, um, uh, of the sexual revolution and everything that, that are happening in the 1890s. Um, that uh, are registered by artists who are trying to focus on the body as an ideal sign for a binary gender. And um, I mean, so this kind of theme of 
both the loss of innocence and the femme fatale run through the new sculpture. I mean, Alfred Gilbert is uh, in the 1880s is doing this and um, uh, Bertram McKennell, the Australian sculptor and others. Um, there's a lot of examples. Um, but I think by understanding that presentation of the danger, the loss of innocence and the temptation of the actual object, this is a way that we can more closely see this, not just as a generic relationship to the the femme fatale um, moment or this anxiety about uh, gender, but actually as a really sustained um, way in which thinking about how desire is operating in relationship to the um, the sculptural body. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been very interested in at this moment is the ways in which the problem of the nude as um, especially as a life-size statue incites questions of desire both to touch to uh, to covet and so on and that um, this was the fine line where sculptors had to be thinking about the um, their desire to um, be modern and embrace a higher degree of uh, representational fidelity and verisimilitude and the ways in which that would incite moralizing panics. And I think that's one way to characterize all of this. The Bates is really interesting as someone, this is his first life-size sculpture, uh, his first figure in the round, really, um, that um, he's navigating what is one of the key um, um, aesthetic uh, and cultural debates of the day is that uh, is this question of uh, desire. So, yeah, there is a question uh, from the audience from Fiona Darling, and I can't uh, read your last name on my screen, unfortunately, Fiona. Uh, but her question is: Do you know of sculptures which have been created twice in two different materials with the intention of changing the meaning of it? I'm thinking of statuettes that have been created in bronze. And then the sculptor produces the same in silver. Does the use of material affect the reading? And if so, do you have evidence of this being done deliberately? Um, well, first of all, I mean, any, if you've ever talked to a sculptor, their choice of materials is deeply important. And so, and all metals, you know, have, you know, that are used in casting have different viscosities, different relationships to the mold. So there is no possibility for um, the shift in um, a material not to be a considered decision by an artist, right? And it also involves the approximations of um, what works in one material to another. So there'll always be differences as well. So I, I think that's a very pragmatic answer to the question, but I think it's important because it is it, it sort of lays the foundation for understanding that a shift in um, in materials is necessarily a shift in meaning. Um, the degree to which that shift um, is um, uh, is hoped for may vary. the The works that are sort of popping to my mind as a, as examples of this actually are a little bit later. You could think of Brancusi's many different versions of the same works that are carved in one material and cast in another. And um, these actually, you know, he'll have the opaque material of a cast plaster um, or, or wood, but the highly shine, uh, the highly reflective material of polished brass. Um, and it's the exact same form. And so that's a good example of how this move between different materials changes things. Um, any shift in materials will also change the way we relate to questions of interior or exterior. So for instance, reflective works tend to focus us psychologically on the contours in the exterior, whereas a work that is non-reflective, we it's easier to ask about its um, contents in a different way or uh, to think of it as a consistent material through and through. So for instance, we imagine that the Pandora by Bates is solid as a marble, um, but we also may um, imagine rightly that the, um, the, the chryselephantine box is hollow. Um, this same sort of set of questions, every new material kind of puts into place. Um, I would, again, uh, Duchamp theorizes this uh, with this concept of the infrathin. One of his great examples are two identical objects, seemingly identical objects made from the same mold. They might appear the same, but they are, you know, 
nevertheless different? And what is the relationship of that? So that kind of theoretical basis um, is a good way to kind of expand out on this. But um, I'm sure it, I could think of, in terms of late Victorian, there's a few different examples like Alfred Gilbert's um, Clarence um, figures are done in different um, materials. Um, and, you know, think about it this way. An easier way is to think about the, the vastly different scale that most 19th century sculptures work with, often with the same composition, um, some of which would be done on their um, um, by themselves and some of it by others and enlargers. I mean, Rodin's entire career is based on just using the same thing again and again and again. So, um, Nicola, can I, I know we're going to end. I just want to jump in if the, if the um, question... I just, sorry, David, if she is able to see the show, then we, you can see the Carpo, Why Born Enslaved was done in many, many different media. Mm -hmm. And it's now in, in uh, you can get it in what, in a candle form. And also the, the courtiers uh, mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, were done in, in many different, and then like you said, the scale, which, which goes to when something was quote, more quote unquote decorative, but the, the courtiers were done in marbles and, and silvers and, all of that. Um, and it's a commercial enterprise too. So there's that aspect of it. But um, it's really interesting anyway. Mm -hmm. my and what one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite works in the show is a very is is the maquette for the head of Icarus by Gilbert, mm -hmm. which is made of wax. And it's he he clearly kept it and it was, you know, it's it belongs to Leeds, Leeds Art Gallery and it's become an object as sort of an artistic object in its own right. And it really has a very strange, uncanny sort of feel. Um, it always reminds me of, of Mark Quinn's Bloodhead because it's got mm. this sort of dark red. It's very dense, the wax, and it's it's very dark red. And you almost feel that, it, you know, it, it, it is almost organic. Um, so I suppose wax is organic, isn't it? It comes from bees. So it's, uh, yeah. So it does have a kind of very different... Um, very di different connotations, I think, than the bronze than the bronze figure would do. I just thought of a good one, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, I uh, so I taught for many years at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, so I know the Art Institute of Chicago collection really well. And um, they have a, um, a a Watts bust of Clayty, um, and that particular composition was done in many different materials. But they have one that is a painted um, plaster that was from the studio that has the kind of um, the casting lines still on it. And it, it produces an entirely different meaning for that sculpture of an Ovidian metamorphosis because of the materials that, it, that it's in. It's very different than the other versions of the Watts bust. So um, it's, it's a, a glorious object. Um, and that one that I thought about a lot that, you know, that where that material transformation leads to an entirely different reading of the work. Um, I will just say just in terms, of, I know we're going to close, but I want to say thank you, Nicola, for talking about this question of modernity. I think one of the reasons why I try to come up with these um, mobile um, questions for sculpture is that I think it allows us to traverse these art historical boundaries that are that often tell us that we shouldn't be looking at things at the same time. And I think one of the things I've been interested in is um, uh, upholding disregarded objects and narratives uh, in my work. And that's um, one of the reasons why the, you know, the modernity of late Victorian sculpture is you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a perverse thing to do, <laughs> as to investigate. But I do think it um, it actually produces some very interesting challenges to the assumptions that underwrite those canonical and mainstream um, received narratives that we have when we start to think about these um, uh, these ways that we can put new combinations together and see different things because of it. And so, and uh, from I haven't seen the show because I'm. Uh, in uh, North America, but from the sounds of it, that's exactly what the exhibition is doing. So I would encourage everyone to go see it. <laughs> that, that was very much Adrienne and my starting point was looking at these objects and think actually, you know, we haven't thought about these objects for a while and they might have something very interesting to tell us about, you know, who we are today and looking at, you know, the history of art and, um, and, it, and they did. I think we, we did find that. There is, there is one more question. Um, if if we if you can bear it, David, uh, what oh, is your yeah. view? 
What is your view on using 3D digital printing technology to create modern forms of sculpture and statues post lockdown? Mm -hmm. It's a great question because we, here we have a, you know, a kind of, um, so the digital versus the analog is really interesting. The idea that uh, information and materials can be broken down to core components and recombined in this kind of atomistic way. And that means that things like 3D printing technology is a, um, can achieve this kind of actuality um, when you're printing out a functional object. And so, um, but at the same time, it can be used to make a little statue or something like that. Um, I think one of the things that it does, like all forms of the rapid digitization of our representational technologies is that it makes heightened realism um, increasingly easy to attain. And so perhaps that might be the way to think about it is that, um, previously, such forms of hyper-realism in sculpture were really only attained through processes of casting, which is a really interesting form of analogic representation at a one-to-one -one scale that maintains this. And now the, the digital means that we don't need to have that indexical relationship with the actual object, but we have something more like a kind of platonic form that can then be printed out. Um, and so, um, but I do think, again, the questions don't just reproduce the answers. So you can ask, how does that relate to these materials? And you can, um, and it may be an interesting or maybe a boring comparison to com to compare the the fruit bowl that you print out to the Pandora's box and the bait sculpture. But the the idea of representational proximity allows you to put those two things into relation. Well, I think we're just we're just running out of time now. I mean, I feel like that discussion um, could carry on, um, and it's been brilliant that we've been able to use the exhibition as a catalyst to um, take this discussion in so many different directions tonight. Um, but I just want to say a huge thank you, first of all, to David for this fantastic lecture, and for Adrian and Nicola for so expertly um, co-chairing the discussion afterwards and bringing this really. Um, uh, thoughtful and wide-ranging discussion. Um, thank you to everybody who has tuned in tonight. Um, and if you've not had a chance to visit the exhibition, please do um, do come to the Institute. Um, the exhibition is on until the 26th of February. Um, and as Rory Medi mentioned, um, uh, David's 2004 article privileging the object of sculpture actuality and harry bates pandora of 1890 will is also get due to be republished shortly alongside a number of newly commissioned essays in a special issue of institutes essays and sculpture um, to accompany the exhibition that's forthcoming in january 2023 um Tonight's our last research event before the Christmas break. Um, in January, we're going to continue our series of events around the colour of anxiety with an in conversation between Professor Gen Jennifer Veer Brody and Adrienne Childs, looking at race in Victorian art and literature and the figure of Octoroon. That's on Wednesday, the 25th of January. And that will be followed by a lecture by Professor Roger Luckhurst on women's spiritualism and art in the late 19th century on Wednesday, the 15th of February. Further date, details about these events and booking information can be found on our website. Um, but for now, thank you again to our fantastic speakers and um, co-chairs, and thank you for all our audience for joining us tonight and for your questions. Um, I hope everyone has a lovely Christmas break and we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Good night. Thank you.